going. So welcome, welcome to Monday of week four. Uh, I thought I'd just start on a little bit of a light note in terms of uh, people's workloads and how they're feeling. Uh, it's evident in the chat that there's there's definitely already a few people who are starting to feel the pinch of one five three one. I think again, if I've described the course. Uh, the course, if you think about, if you think about, you can save this graph if you really want to, but think about like week one, week two, week, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like this, right? Um, the course very kind of gently, it kind of, it, it starts off not super easy with Git and then it stays pretty steady and iteration one's kind of easy, sorry, iteration zero is kind of easy and then it like kind of picks up a lot for a while and then it tapers off kind of like it a bit here-ish. Um, so you're kind of on the beginning of like the upward swing of a bit of a challenge. Uh, but that's okay. It's not going to get like substantially harder, but you're probably going to start to actually feel like a bit of a pinch from the course for the first time. So again, we'll be here to support you. Tutors have been really nice just supporting on the forum and everything else, which is super exciting, which is really nice. Um, that always warms my heart a lot. Um, and also, this is a really, 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 really important note, which is that your labs, they've actually been redesigned this term. And a big thing that I was very keen on was to limit the number of labs you have. So you actually only have labs one, two, three, four, five, eight. So as of today, you're more, you're like halfway through the labs in the course, if that makes sense. Um, which is like a really good piece of news as far as I'm concerned, right? Because it means that like you just do lab four, lab five, and then there's another kind of small lab in week eight. So this kind of like juggling the labs um, is, uh, you know, something that something that's just like a little bit of the early part of the course. Um, the one week that is hardest is probably... Um, I'd probably say it's this coming week because you've got your iteration one due on Friday and then your lab four on the Monday. Um, oh, I really wanted to avoid that. Originally, we wanted to do like week one, two, three, five, and eight for the labs so that like your iterations and your labs were kind of due alternating. But if I'm going to be perfectly honest, we just looked at the content. We just looked at the lessons and there's just a certain minimum number of things we need to expose you to um, and there's, there was no way to kind of cut week four lab out without kind of really making week five labs, just like week five lab crazy big or something like that. So, um, appreciate your patience. And also, you know, as always, please keep leaving feedback. These are new labs. I mentioned that at the start of the course. So, uh, you know, we're not going to get everything right and we'll adjust for next time. Um, I know that doesn't do a lot for you, but, uh, you know, you're all standing on the shoulders of giants prior and everything else. Um, <clears throat> this week, week four, is a particularly fun and interesting week because we have two we have two topics, and one of the topics is tonight, which is advanced functions, and then the topic after that is HTTP servers, and that is a big topic. We're going to start that tonight probably, and then we are then we're going to finish it off on on Wednesday. Again, the the lecture on the second lecture this week is on Wednesday. I know that's a little bit annoying. I'm really sorry about that. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about 4.1 tonight. Um, this is uh, this is an entirely new lecture. I said the other day that static verification was the one entirely new lecture in the course, but that was somewhat a bit deceiving because it's what I'd call the the new topic, the completely new concept we're introducing. The idea of static verification. 4.1 though is actually not an entirely new topic, it's tied a lot to JavaScript and what you can do with languages like JavaScript. Um, and therefore it's a whole new lecture, but it's not really like this new area of software engineering. We're actually just learning a lot about JavaScript as a topic and what you can do with JavaScript in the area of functions. The reason that we're teaching this is solely because, I mean, it's, it's cool. It's a cool topic and you'll learn some cool things, but um, that's not enough for me to want to teach you something in an already busy course. The reason this is here is because the deeper you get with JavaScript, and you might have also noticed this already with Jest, there are just some obscure and interesting ways JavaScript can be used. And if you don't understand them, you'll find that things just confuse you a lot. So 
Um, if you like programming, if you like just little bits of code and stuff, this should be a fun little lecture. So let's let's go through that together now. Um, this is one of the last development lectures in the course, as in one of the last kind of coding lectures we do, and it is on what we call advanced functions, which is really just taking JavaScript functions to like a really cool degree and doing cool things with them. And if, if your only programming background has been C, this is going to be wild. Uh, if your background's C and Python, it's going to be semi-wild, I guess, depending on what you do. Um, and it's all really around this idea that higher level languages like JavaScript have many powerful methods of how we can use functions, right? When you think about C, functions are these really kind of, I don't want to say soulless, but they're these really simple things. They're a name that takes in parameters and they have return values. And if you want many functions, you just define many functions. But we're going to be talking about a few things tonight, in particular first class functions and higher order functions, which are concepts that apply to many other programming languages, not just JavaScript, as well as callbacks, which are another really interesting idea. Um, and then function syntax is just a bit of a, a pre-topic that's JavaScript specific. As always, the disclaimer, um, in the last couple of lectures, and same for the lecture tomorrow with HTTP servers, so that's all of these lectures here, I will disclaim typically by stating that, and no matter how many times I said it, we still got forum posts about it, so, you know, maybe I don't need to try so hard, but um, all of these lectures have nothing to do with iteration one. We try and teach topics a bit earlier, like a common piece of feedback we used to get in the course was that we teach you something in a lecture and then you'd be expected to use it later that week. Um, Whereas the reason we're kind of teaching these things early so that you have time to process it and, and start using it, like in week five. So everything we're kind of doing is not to do with iteration one. And even more, advanced functions aren't really like a topic we directly assess. It's actually just something that's useful for other topics. Um, so, you know, don't feel too stressed about that. So firstly, let's talk about function syntax. A lot of this lecture, you might have seen some things around relating to it. Um, you might have seen things that you go, hmm, this seems interesting. I don't know what this is. Is this normal JavaScript? And um, there's actually basically three methods in JavaScript to define functions. There's the first one over here on the left, right? Which is method one. And method one is the old school method. It's, it's kind of the original JavaScript functions. It's still used sometimes. Uh, we use it in this course because it's, you know, nice and simple and it's very familiar to C and other programming languages, but it is kind of old school and it's not really used a whole bunch. Then we have method two over here and method two um, is where we kind of start to treat functions a little bit differently or more specifically, we start to treat functions like variables in the sense that uh, instead of saying, you know, const sum equals five or const sum equals a string, we actually say const sum is equal to a function. So we're actually kind of assigning a function to a variable. So if you really compare the syntax on the left and the right here, method one and method two, you'll see that they're kind of the same. It's just, they're all, you know, jarbled around in a different order. So instead of saying a function is called sum that takes in A and B, we're actually saying sum is a function that takes in A and B. So it's, it's saying the same thing, just in a different kind of way. Um, this became a bit uh, more kind of common and trendy, I don't know, a long time ago, like 10, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, and there's a few reasons that's good, which we'll get to soon. Uh, and then method three is a much more modern method that helps you define functions even more simply with less syntax. And you'll see that it's basically the same as method two here except we've dropped the need for function and we've actually put this little equals arrow here between A, B and the brace. So they all say the same thing. They're all literally identical. They do the exact same thing, but they're just kind of more and more modern and they all work. They all work perfectly fine. Um, but number three is something you actually see a lot and you'll see it a lot more around once you notice it is, is the main thing, right? So if we kind of go further down this topic, um, and I know these slides are kind of small. We will, you'll also see that with TypeScript, it's identical as well. Um, we did talk about TypeScript a bit last week. So this is, I know the slides are small, you can view them on your own screen, but, um, or 1080p is usually fine, but same kind of thing. If you want to create TypeScript functions here, you can just use A number, B number, just like that, perfectly similar. Um, we're going to use TypeScript for a lot of the rest of this lecture, just to try and reinforce that idea um, into you. And uh, the other thing about method three, which if you remember method three, instead of saying function sum, we actually say const sum equals then the brackets here. So if we just 
jump back up a slide for a second. Method three was this one here. Const sum equals parameters equals sign equals arrow braces. And method one's the one you've been working with so far. Um, with method three, there's actually an even shorter way of using it, uh, which is that if all your function does is actually just return one thing, just a single thing, you can actually just shorten it even further and get rid of the braces and get rid of the return value. And it does the exact same thing here. Now, am I saying you have to use these new methods? Am I saying you have to make it even more compact? No, I'm not. What I'm saying is you'll see this a lot. So we're trying to show you this, not for you to do it, but for you to understand it when you inevitably see it. So these two things are equivalent here. And remember, this further shortening of functions only works when it's a one line, one, it's technically one statement, but let's just call it a one line return function. Um, so this function here, sum, will take an A that's a number, B that's a number, and it will return you the sum of A plus B. <coughs> Um, and if we look at a few more examples here, right, let's look at this function here, function many string takes and repeat number string string. We talked about this last, um, last week and, you know, let's actually try and maybe, let's maybe try and run this one, you know, have a bit of fun with it. So if I go into 1531 slash code, let me open up my favorite editor. Right, we got a few things here. Uh, you can actually see that, you know, if we open up, what file was that? That was file 4.1 many string, right? So 4.1 many string one, like this. Um, and then we go inside of our m 2 folder. We should be able to do what we did last week, which was run npm run ts node, because remember with TypeScript, we can't just run node. And then I should be able to run source slash 4.1 many string one. And I get my output, right? Repeat hello five times. So this function here, if I just get my stupid head out of the way, um, this is this is the method one function syntax. If I wanted to turn this into method two function syntax, I would do a very simple transformation, which is I would say, I would remove the function, put a const here and put the function there like that. That's all I'm doing. It's very, very straightforward. It's, it's, it's very little code. Um, and this would also work. You'll see when I run this, this also works completely fine. Hello, hello, hello. And then if I want to take it to the method three, I drop the function and I go and put an equals arrow sign there. And again, I get the exact same thing. So you can see they're all very, very similar and very closely related here. Um, and this is just the demo that we're looking at in the slides. They do the exact same thing. That's just what I showed you here. You can go and look up those three examples, but you'll notice that all those functions were identical except for how we define them in the first line. Very similar. That's it on the function syntax. So the summary of that vertical deck of slides is that um, in JavaScript, there are three ways to define functions. You will not see method two a lot. Uh, method three is kind of like the evolution of method two. You'll still see one around a bunch and three around a bunch. So keep an eye out for this kind of syntax here. The next important thing that really ties ties as an expansion to what we just talked about is this is an idea of what we call first class functions. What you'll see over here on the right is a function definition that uses the third method of defining functions, right? Um, and the first one here is just a standard variable declaration, right? Const name is Hayden, console log Hayden, really simple stuff. Uh, on the right, it's a function. What do you notice that's similar about these? You know, they, they kind of, you know, they don't look the same, but they do kind of vaguely look similar in the, in the sense that the one on the left is creating a name called name, which is equal to the value Hayden. And the one on the right is creating a name called get name, which is equal to a function. So get name is a function, name is, name is a string. They're both just, uh, you know, variables. And in this way, we can treat functions really similar to variables and we can actually do that with console log. Um, and you'll see that if we do this in terminal, right, where if I come here and say, I have a variable here called const name equals Hayden, and I go on console log, say, you know, many string, or I go on console log name, I can console log both of those things. And hopefully TS node, oh, what a, didn't like that I, mm, okay. 
without getting into the craziness of things, name stuff. I can fix this up another way, but let's let's just get through this for the moment. You can see that the first console log was a function many string, and the second console log was my name. So JavaScript is interpreting both of these as variables. The first one just happens to be a function, the second one just happens to be a string. You know? Um, we refer to this behavior, it's a language behavior, and we refer to this as when a language has first class functions. The reason it's called first class functions is because um, it's when first it's when functions are treated just like any other variable. So you might often hear the phrase, you know, um, uh, treat them like a first class citizen, you know, as in an important person in society. And when we say first class functions, we're just saying that functions are an important person of the JavaScript variable, the JavaScript thing society. I don't, I've never really said that out loud before, but um, it's where we can treat them exactly like variables. And the reason that this is so interesting to us is because it allows us to pass functions into other functions as parameters, just like we pass variables into other functions. So we have this ability to, to pass functions into functions. You might have been exposed to this in C potentially, either from like a really nerdy kid or if you've done 2521, it might have come up about the idea of function pointers. It's all kind of a very similar concept, but let's actually look at this whole idea of passing functions into functions because that's why first class functions are interesting. Who, who cares about this function syntax over, I always can't do it that way, yeah. Who cares about this function syntax here? Like whoop-de-doo, you can define functions that way. How exciting, what's more exciting is how you can use it. So how you can use it is that, um, you know, firstly, this is just a very standard way of defining a function that you're used to. I create a function called say hi, name string, the parameter takes in a string, returns hello name, console log say hi in the name, right? That works perfectly fine. Obviously, again, we could run that really easily. MP run, npm run ts node 4.1, sorry, source slash 4.1, uh, fcf bar, that was the name of the file, right? It'll just run and we'll get the output we want. Hello, Hayden. Um, but first class functions make this stuff really, 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 really interesting. Uh, and we can expand this idea and say that we can write a function that produces a different output based on a function that's inputted. So we can pass a function into this function. And I might pull this up in the text editor, right? Um, just so that we can see it in a bit more detail. What's the code called again? FCF format. Atomic? Yeah. So let's have a look at this code here together. Um, and let's, let's, let's deconstruct it because there's a couple of TypeScript things here. And there's a couple of few other things. So firstly, let's just look at functions. Let's look at lines three to five. This is a very simple function, function brackets, that takes in a string, which is of type, takes in a variable called str, which is of type string. And it returns that string here wrapped in parentheses. I have another function called full stop. Full stop takes in one parameter called str, which is of type string, and it simply returns that string with a full stop after it. Right? The more interesting part here is that I have a function called say hi, which takes in a parameter called name, which is a string. Then it takes in this thing called a format, which is basically a function, right? We'll get into the typing in a second, but it's basically a function. I could put this as like an any or something, right? Any type to start. And what that does is that returns, um, you know, hello, comma, and then it returns the result of format name. So it actually calls the function format and passes name into it. But what is the format function, right? We haven't defined a function format anywhere here. Format is actually just the function that is passed in like this. And therefore, you know, if I call say hi with the name Hayden like this and the format brackets, it's actually passing the brackets function into my function so that when I actually go hello, it actually takes name and it calls brackets on that name and returns that. So what I can actually do here is I can create a single function called say hi, which I can call in two different scenarios with two different functions as inputs, as parameters and get a result. And you'll see this, you know, naturally when I run this. Ah. Format atomic, 
Hopefully this works. Yep. So you see that it first says hello, Hayden in parentheses, exclamation mark, dash dash, which is a string literal. Hayden dot exclamation mark, because, you know, that's how it's structured. Um, if you don't understand this, I would really recommend that you pause and like take a moment to digest it because like this is a very simple and important example. But the idea here again is very simple. We are passing in the function that we want to be called within that function. So say hi is a function that takes in a function as a parameter and then it uses that function inside of it. And the reason this is great is because what this does is it really just helps us like what would you normally do? Like think about it. If you were writing C, you would maybe just come along and say, well, you know, hello, that, and then you would come along here and say, you know, hello, uh, that, you know, like you would do this and you would get rid of that function. And then instead of calling say hi, you would just call say hi brackets like this. And then you would call, you know, um, full stop. Like this does the exact same thing, right? This is probably what you would do if I asked you to do this in C. It, it gives you the exact same result, but you've repeated yourself. So. The benefit of first class functions as an idea, which is passing functions into other other functions because you pass them in as like, you know, um, variables is that it helps you repeat yourself less, particularly with more complicated logic scenarios. And I think I'm just, I might jump, I, I hope I'm not jumping the gun here. Um, no, let me keep moving and I'll come back to an example. Sometimes I get so excited, I just kind of tell you something I'm going to tell you later and then we get all jarbled and confused. So uh, that's that's the example. Now, one thing you will have noticed, though, is that the format function, the format parameter is of type FMTR. That's a name I made up. I'm going to rename that to Koala right now, just so you see that it's a completely made up name. Um, that is a type definition. So this here is TypeScript. And what I've said here is that the Koala type is a function. So this is actually me in TypeScript describing a function. So the koala, or what maybe we could call format function, is simply a function that takes in a string parameter and it outputs a string. And I know that syntax is a little bit weird there, so let me really quickly take you through it. I could have a function called blah, which takes in a string and it simply returns string plus high. Right? Like this. If I was to use the more modern function syntax, I'd say const blah equals function that. And if I was to take it even further with method three, I would have it like this. And then if I was to use what I did before, where we said, if you have a one line return function, you can actually get rid of the braces and the return, and you can end up with this. What do you get reduced to? You say that const blah is a function that takes in a variable called str and returns another string. So what you're really looking at here, right, is this is just a JavaScript function and this is just a type for a function. So it looks very foreign and it looks very weird and new, but, and I'm not saying that you should all be like, oh, perfect, I'm going to go write function type definitions right now because your brain's probably melting. But my, my point is that it makes sense. It, it actually, it eventually makes sense. Somewhere down the line, it will make sense. So um, if you don't want to do that, let's say you went to write this code tomorrow you've been playing around with TypeScript, you're like, oh, I kind of get TypeScript a little bit, it scares me a bit. Well, you don't need that. You can actually start off simple, right? Not everyone needs to be a hero or overnight. This is a perfectly fine function. It's not perfect. Well, this is a pretty fine function. It's not perfect. Uh, and you can go away and remove that any later. You, in fact, if you don't even know what these should be, you could just use TypeScript and replace anything with any. And now it's basically just JavaScript, right? There's no typing happening here. So don't feel like you have to kind of go and nail the typing elements of things on day one. You can actually come back and say, okay, now that I understand TypeScript more, I'm going to go and format that correctly. Like I'm going to go and give it a type and be like, yes, format is a function that takes in a string and it returns a string. Great. And then this is great because this means that TypeScript will now make sure that people don't abuse your functions in terms of that, It'll make sure that if someone, like watch this, right? This is where TypeScript gets very beneficial. If someone says, you know, produce zero, a function that takes in a string and it simply returns zero, right? Watch what happens if I now try and call it. If I now say, say hi with produce zero, because I have told TypeScript that my say hi function expects a parameter format that takes in 
something of this type, it will look at the type here and it will say, no, 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 produce zero is a function that takes in a string and outputs an int. And it will get annoyed. It's like, hey, argument of type string string that returns a number is not assignable to a parameter of type format function. Like the errors are actually really helpful because you've kind of, you've been very declarative and clear as to how your program should operate, you know? And th that's kind of a lot of what TypeScript is. That's a lot of, um, it's kind of like, te it's really not that dissimilar to testing really, you know? Like we talked a lot about dynamic testing, helping make sure that you have a good foundation so that if someone goes and accidentally breaks your code later, the tests are like, hey, hey what are you doing? You know, pick up on it. Um, but TypeScript and typing in general, TypeScript's just JavaScript's typing. It's really not that different. It's all the same concept. So that's all cool. Uh, but we can simplify this even more using our alternative function syntax too, right? Because a lot of the functions, think about what's happening here. A lot of these functions are kind of method one style. And what do we know about how we can convert them? Well, let's just do them all in bulk for fun, right? Instead of this, I could say, well, you know, const that equals function this, okay? That's moving from method one to method two. And then again, I could take that further by moving it to method three. Okay, great. Now our code looks a little bit easier and it's kind of easy to read in a sense too, because you can kind of just see the names of everything, you know, const brackets, const full stop, const say hi, const result. It's all kind of just flowing like that. And then again, you could take it further and say, hey, look at this. We've got these functions that are one line return functions. And what, are, what, are, you know, what did Hayden say about that? Well, I can, if it's just returning one thing, I can get rid of the braces and the return. So now I can, you know, get rid of that, get rid of that return, remove that. And then suddenly, if I make this code just a little bigger, our whole file gets reduced down to this. And, and I know to you right now, you might be thinking, oh, that kind of looks ugly. Like that looks really confusing. I have no idea what that does. Part of that's because you haven't done a lot of this stuff with JavaScript before. But if you actually, once you get used to it, this is actually really clear code because it's like, okay, brackets here is a function. I can tell it's a function because it looks like a function, you know, parentheses equals arrow this. Uh, and the function takes in a string and it just returns the string with parentheses. Okay, full stop does the same with a full stop. Say hi, um, you know, may maybe, you know, this is quite a long line of code. I, I would genuinely consider maybe, you know, that should just be like that, you know, realistically. What did I do on the slides? No, nope. it was a hero. So same kind of thing, you know, um, it can help simplify your code. I'm not saying you have to do that at all, but you can. Um, and you'll see other people do it a lot too, which is really important. Um, now let's look at something slightly more complicated, uh, which is applying, let's use functions as arguments, like pass functions into functions, but now let's apply them within a loop. Whew. Okay, this should be fun. So we got this other, this we got this file here called format loop, format, Oop, sorry, format loop, right? Let's look at it again. Okay, type FMTR. Let me rename that just so it's similar to what we saw before, format function. Um, it has a function called brackets, which we know what it does. I have a const name, which is an array with Hayden, Juliana, Tam in it. I've got a function that's like method one style function here called format names. Format names takes in a list, which is an array of strings. Okay, so, uh, 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 and a string array, more specific, same thing. Um, so I got like an array with strings in it and then it takes in a function called format. Yeah. I'm going to create a new list here with the square brackets and then I'm going to have a for loop. And what I'm going to do is to my new list, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to go and take what's in the old list and then format it. Right. So I take what's in the old list, I format it into and put it in the new list. So it's kind of like, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what a good example is. You know, it's like you have a pile of carrots. You know, you got a pile of carrots and you pick up a carrot and you, you peel it and you put it in the new pile, you pick up the next carrot, you peel it. You're kind of formatting the carrot, right? The example has a few problems in it, but you are essentially, you know, looking through one pile and, and building another pile. The only difference with the reason that analogy is bad is because you're not actually like deleting the carrots from the old pile. You're just kind of copying them. But the point is that you're kind of building up a new list here like this. And you can see that what this then allows me to do is to say, well, <clears throat> here are my names. I've got this function that will 
take in an original list and a format function and I can call it and I can say, hey, I'd like you to format all of my names, Hayden, Juliana, Tam, and I'd like to give you a formatter function, a function that tells you what, how to peel, are you peeling, are you cutting, like tell me how to, to, to manipulate them um, so that when it loops through my old list and it starts adding them to my new list, it's kind of changing them and that changing is to add parentheses here. And again, you can see this very clearly if we run the code um, format loop, right? So if we just run this code here, like this, you will see that what will happen is that it now prints out Hayden, Juliana and Tam with parentheses around the outside. And we could take this even further, right? We could create another one called more names and we could console log this. And because we are using first class functions, because this function format names is taking in a function, I could make a new function called, um, I don't know, uh, scream. Right, and then Scream, all Scream does is Scream simply returns the string uh, to uppercase, right, makes it uppercase. Just going to delete some lines of code here. So now instead of that, I'm going to have more names, which is Scream. So now you can see it's very easy to expand on our code so that we can basically generate another copy of the list, except they're now in capitals. Very, very kind of useful stuff, right? And again, this code can all be simplified down quite a bit just by using, you know, the new function syntax. And it just becomes a little bit easier to read sometimes, particularly for short functions like this. Now, there is a good question in the chat, and that question um, is from... My stupid app doesn't... Every time I want to highlight a question, it just doesn't show up. Um, yeah, Jay says, what's the benefit of doing const instead of function? Um, Oh, like it's hard to say because style and, and layout is such a personal thing. <coughs> but what I tell you is that you can't write these cute little one-liners with the function syntax. So like you can kind of write it like you could be like, you'd be like function scream, you know, string string like this. And, and this happens. This is a lot around the internet and stuff. Like it's not like not normal. Um, but a few things about this. The first one is... This is as condensed as you can get this particular code, right? Um, and even with the other method too, if you just write, you know, const scream equals function string string, the same thing. This is as condensed as you can get this one too. So there are kind of limitations on, you know, this is method one and this is method two here. You know, and this one up here is <coughs> method three, right? But um, so, you know, there's no way you can kind of get rid of that return. The syntax just doesn't exist. The second thing, though, that I think is important is that when you define things with a more um, variable-like style, you actually have a few more consistent elements of your programming. A good example is that the JavaScript... Uh, <coughs> sorry, I've been talking all day. The JavaScript function definite, like the language definition actually says that you don't put semicolons at the end of function definitions. Like, notice that here, we don't put a semicolon here. Whereas when we define things through method 2 and method 3, which kind of treat functions like variables, we actually do put a semicolon at the end because they are variables. It's just like a variable definition. Instead of putting a string here, I'm just putting a function. And that's really helpful because it, it starts to, again, it just starts to standardize the way you're coding. Um, so I think, you know... Um, Consistency is probably a massive element of that, I would say. But, you know, this isn't some big thing, you know, that you have to do. This is just like a common thing that happens and I can probably tell you why. So, um, that was us using some fun loopy things. And then, you know, I did the new function syntax with you just then and I did... I. Yes, so... This is with the new function syntax. <coughs> Taking it one step further... Let's now look at a really important topic, which is anonymous functions. Now, there's a really strong chance that this is the first time you've come across anonymous functions in your degree. Um, anonymous functions are functions that don't have a name. That's why we call them anonymous. And they're used when a function only really intends to be used once in code, as in it's called once. Like, think about your code. You've probably written a bunch of code where you define a function and you only ever call it once. 
And I'm not saying that every function that is only ever called once should be this magical anonymous function. What we're saying is that it can be. And what anonymous functions are, and I'll just show you the code again because the code will make your life a little bit easier to understand. Yeah, anonymous functions are used all the time in Jest. Absolutely nailed it. Hello, Clayton. Ho hello, hello, Clayton. Clay Clayton? Hello, Clayton. I don't know why I said that four times. Um, so, you know, we've got this like format loop new here. Here, this is our code. And if we only use brackets once, right? The function, not the, the syntax. If we only use the variable brackets, which is a function once, instead of defining it, right and then using it here we can actually and, and this is remarkably straightforward when you think about it brackets is just this function so instead of defining it like okay simple sim really simple example instead of saying const name equals Hayden and saying console.log name right I could simplify that code and just be like console log Hayden haha <laughs> it's like condensed it Hayden is now an anonymous string it doesn't have a name it's not a variable I've just used it I've just defined it and used it at the same time we can do the exact same thing when it comes to functions and say instead of defining this function as a brackets how about I just copy it and I paste it directly down here like this and then I can get rid of my brackets and whilst the syntax looks very immediately overwhelming it actually makes a lot of sense because instead of putting a variable here referring to a function, a first class function, I can simply put that function in directly. And this is where the other benefits of these more um, kind of, you know, modern function syntax come in. Because now it's really handy if I want to say format names another way. Remember what we did in the last example? We said const, you know, uh, scream names or something equals whatever and then we went and copied it. But what it means now is I don't have to go and define a whole other function, right? I can actually just say, I'm going to put an, sorry. I can just put another anonymous function here that just says, you know, string to uppercase like this. See that? See how I'm able to like, use my format names is a function that takes in functions, a function. Um, but instead of having to define them explicitly, like I've done in this loop example up here, I can just use them because I might only intend to use them once. If I intend to use it multiple times in my code, then I, I need to kind of define it. But this is really helpful because now I can go and run this code. Um, loop new, and this should run and it should give me my screaming case that we're used to, right? Hayden, Juliana, Tam. However, um, I can take this even further because what do we know about JavaScript functions? If JavaScript functions just return one, if they're one line functions, which this one is, I can get rid of the braces and I can get rid of the return. So I get rid of the brace, I get rid of the return, I get rid of the brace. And now suddenly things start to look quite wacky and weird. Maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way, I'll leave that judgment to you. This is all valid JavaScript now. And again, whilst it might give you a headache when you look at it immediately, it's actually a very elegant thing, which is why you'll see it used all the time, which is now I've managed to write code. And in fact, let me take this down here. I've defined this type, which is a function that is a string returning a string. Um, and similarly, by the way, anonymous functions, anonymous is just a concept in programming. You could have anonymous uh, types. I don't need to define this here. I could actually just go and put it right here. You know, like everything's, everything's the same. This is just what you do with variables. It's all just the same. So this code here is all totally fine code. <clears throat> because I'm never going to use this type a second time, maybe I don't need to extract it out. Maybe I do. Maybe it's good style. Which is easier for the programmer to read? That's the question you need to keep coming back to. But let's, let's summarize this code now. Okay, format names. Great. List string format string here, great, returns a string. We know what that function does. I go and create a names array. I create a new names array that is the result of calling format names. And I know format names just goes through my names array and applies a function to every variable, which is this function here, because this is a function, right? Uh, and I do the exact same thing for screen names. And now I have <coughs> what is a fairly concise, but still clear piece of code that works. And that's why you'll see that kind of syntax used quite extensively. So in summary, um, first class functions are predominantly used uh, in terms of letting functions take in other functions and function, functions, functionments. I should patent that. Um, 
taking other functions as arguments. And then why do we like to do this? It allows us to create more clear and concise code. Code can be shorter. We can avoid unnecessary repetition. Um, and it's used a lot with anonymous functions. And as Hello Clayton has pointed out, if we actually go back and have a look at some of our jest examples back from like 2.4 and stuff, um, you will notice that this is all jest is, in fact. I don't think about this too deeply if it confuses you, but you'll actually start to look back at your jest functions and be like, huh, describe is actually just a function that takes in a string. Actually, let me look at a simpler one. Test is just a function that takes in a string and then it takes in a function here, an anonymous function that doesn't have any parameters. Okay. And then describe here is just a function that takes in a string and then it takes in a function with no parameters that contains all the stuff here. So this is the reason we actually teach this. Like I don't love teaching this topic because I'm like, it's an intro course. Like I don't like to teach anything that's unnecessary because I think people can really easily underestimate how difficult learning can be. But um, it's very hard to just hand wave this for too long until people start just asking questions. So that's that's what this is essentially. A lot of first class functions, a lot on, on anonymous functions. Um, however, in the notes here, you might also... Um, hey, Jack. Jack's just joined us. Jack says, Jack says completely forgot this was on. Um, let me see if I can get my comments fixed up. Give it a sec. Um, yeah. Hey, Jack. How's it going? Um, however, um, this is really funny. Um, I rewrote part of this slide and this slide here used to say in summary, why? And then I said something about it's really useful for callbacks. Uh, and then I deleted that reference, but that's kind of problematic because if you look, if you look here, there's a line underneath it that says what the F is called, but what the, F, the hell is a callback? Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, let's talk about callbacks is the point in a sec. Um, after we do a few more things, we're nearly at the end. There's only two more kind of topics. We might run till just, we might run just over the midway point just so we can finish this topic and start on the, the web stuff. The web stuff will be really light tonight because it'll be very theoretical and anyway. So, this is where a really important topic comes in um, and you'll see this around all the time and it's going to make your life really easy, which is good. A few people in Monday and Tuesday tutorials were exposed to this in week two. This was an accident. It's a very weird concept that we don't like to teach until um, after you like get a bit deeper and do this lecture. So if you've seen it before, it's like, great, now it'll make more sense. But there are three really, really heavily used functions in JavaScript. And in fact, these, these aren't JavaScript functions. These are functions used in many high-level languages. And they're functions called map, reduce, and filter. Um, these are functions that act on array objects. These are array things, right? This is, this is a, an array, arrays topic. It has nothing to do with JavaScript objects. It has nothing to do with strings or whatever. It's to do with arrays. Um, and it's, it's, it's there to help us accomplish basic iterative tasks without the overhead of loop setup. We've already seen one of these tonight in tonight's lecture. Um, and they use the ideas of first class functions and anonymous functions a lot. So, um, map as a function is about modifying an array. Filter is about selecting, reduce is about summarizing. And let's talk about these things. So, the first one is map. And in fact, we've already come across the map one already a moment ago, if you can reflect on where that might have been. And map one, what it does is it takes an array of size n and it produces a new array of size n having modified each element according to a function passed in. If you want a better example than my carrot example, imagine that you've got like 10 sheets of paper, right? 10 pages of a book. You go and photocopy them. And after you photocopy them, you like sign your name at the bottom of all of them. And now you have a second pile of 10 pages of a book that has your signature on it. What you've done is you've taken an, uh, an array of size n, 10 pages, and you've gone and created a new array of size n, another 10 pages, except you modified them all by some kind of function, which in this case is to sign it. So it's the same array size, modified elements, 
So input size 10, output size 10, but they're different. Um, this is how you would solve this problem currently, and you've probably already done this. You've probably done this in one in one five one one. You might have done it in one five three one already. I have a list of tutors. I have a function called shout, where I'm going to take in a string and I'm going to uppercase it, um, and then I'm going to create a new list, right? Um, and then a for loop, and that for loop is going to go through the original list of tutors, and it's going to create a new tutor, which is like going to be the old tutor but shouting, and then it's going to push that new tutor to the list, and then you know, so it's kind of like you know, create a new list and loop through the old list and push things across, right? It's a really similar standard programming pattern. And if we just have a look at its usage, uh, it will certainly feel familiar to you because we can try it out right now. If we just run, um, you know, this is kind of what we call map old as in the old way you would map things. You probably don't think of it like mapping. Simon, Teresa, Kai, Michelle. Um, bam, there you go, uh, mapped it. However, JavaScript has a built-in method to do this for you. Wicked, check this out. I wonder if I highlighted the lines. I didn't. That's a shame. I should really do that um, and make a note of that. You know, you can like highlight the particular lines of code. I think it's really cool. So um, what you'll notice here is that we've replaced this entire section here with this one line on line 11. Because instead of having to do all this, we just use map. And what map does is it takes an array, tutors, it goes through every element in that array and it produces an entirely new array with modified elements according to this function. So shout has been, shout is a function to modify the new array. Um, very straightforward. Very cool too, right? Map is a function on an array. So if you have an array, you can call dot map on it and you can pass in a function to, to you know, to do something with it. Um, very, very handy. Filter is kind of an inverse concept. Um, filtering isn't so much like filtering is a really easy concept to grasp. Filtering is like, you know, um, <clears throat> photocopying 10 pages, but only having the new pages. You, you only keep the ones that are full of text and you throw out all the other ones. It's the idea of taking an array of size N an input size and producing a new array that is anywhere between empty and size N, but could be any size, but you don't modify any of the data. So you're not actually changing the data, you're just selecting. It's like choosing a subset. So it's possibly a smaller array with the elements unchanged. And when you look at it here, what this means, similar function, like you, you've done something like this before. Let me pull it up in, in the editor, right? You got something like filter old here and filter old has a bunch of marks. It has a function that tells you whether it passed or not, right? This is in method two function syntax. Again, just to reiterate the point, we could simplify this down really far if we wanted. Here's a really nice function here called isPass that takes in a mark and it returns whether or not the mark's greater or equal to 50. Very powerful and concise. And then I've got my typical new list and then I loop through the old list. And then if the old list has a mark that passed in it, I add it to my new list. And this is kind of how I would kind of classically filter. And again, you've probably seen something like this before where you have you're able to filter through these marks of 65, 72, 81, 40, 56, and it removes the, the 41, like that. And you end up with these. So really common thing, again, you've probably done it a bunch of times and in JavaScript and many other languages, there is a, a faster way of doing it, which is to just use dot filter. So again, array marks, I call dot filter and I give the filter a function. And that function here, right, is the thing that's used to select it. And this is really crazy powerful because if you look at an original piece of code like this, which is very C style, right? Very kind of old school C style. I can simplify it like this. I can replace all of this code here with a simple new list equals marks.filter is pass, where marks is the original list. And I say, go through it and only filter out things that return true because what you pass into filter is a true false function. It basically returns true or false as to whether to include it or not. And you might look at that and think, oh, that's pretty neat, right? That's pretty concise and cute and stuff. Seems to work fine. But again, what did we learn about anonymous functions? If I'm only using this function once, I don't need to define it. I can just pass it straight in there. And now we have this piece of code, this piece of code that takes in a list 
and it gives me a new list by filtering the current list based on this function that I've defined in line. And again, I'm not saying that all of you should turn around tomorrow and just smash out code like this. And to be perfectly honest, you know, many of you won't do it. And I don't think you should because it's a lot of new concepts. But when you see this, you will again know what it's doing. And that's the most important thing. There's the third type of function, which is called reduce. Reduce is, as far as I'm concerned, the least interesting one because I just rarely use it, to be honest. Like map filter, like I would use map and filter for every 100 times I use a map, reduce, or filter, 49 of them are map, 49 of them are filter, and two of them are reduce. Most of the time you'll use reduce will just be for summing up numbers. There are cases for it, it's just not the kind of day-to-day -day cases, but essentially a reduce function conceptually takes an array and it turns it into a single value. That's it. How does it do that? Well, the common way again is to sum up the numbers, right? If I give you a list of 10 numbers and I say, what's the sum of those numbers? You would call that a reduction, a reduce process to bring it down to a sum. But that's just because your operator you're using is a plus, right? It's the sum, that's the function you use. So if we look at again, some classic ways of summing up marks here, right on the left, we have our students an array of objects and each object has a name and a mark key. And then we have a single variable here that's equal to zero. We have a for loop that loops through all the students. So each student is an object. And then what we do is single was like the starting that variable. We now sum that up. So single plus equals student dot mark. So we're kind of summing up the marks as we go through it. Again, a very standard programming pattern you're used to. A, um, I don't know why this one on the left here doesn't have uh, a type definition, but that's okay. Um, but we can use a reduce function instead and reduce functions, they're also a bit more complicated. I think that's another reason why reduce functions aren't as used as much because for simple cases, they're barely even, they're barely even easier to read the code. Um, but what reduce functions do is that when you call reduce on an array, you pass in a reducer, a reduce function. And that reduce function is a function that takes in a previous number and a current number and sums them together. And I don't think I can explain this to you verbally very well at all. So let me just try and explain it visually, which is like, if I have a bunch of numbers like this, what a reduce function does is that when you loop through this list, what it essentially does is it always has a starting value that you have to specify, right? Which in this case is zero. And I've specified it here. And what you do from that is that the reduce function takes in the current sum, right, which is zero, and the next number, and it sums them together. And the output of this is 17. And then this is your new sum. And then what the reduce function does is it keeps iterating through the list and it says, I'm going to sum up 17 and 50, and the sum of that is 67. And then it says, great, 67. So it's like a running total, right? This is kind of how you might have summed up tons of things in your life. Then it grabs that 67, which is the current total and the next number. And it says, great, that's 120. Sorry that I can't draw. And then again, same thing. We grab 120 and 22. We get 144. And then it goes and scoops up 144 and 68. And you end up with 100 and 212. That's what a reduce function is. Now, and that's why it says previous and current. So current here is like the running total. Oh, sorry, previous is the running total and, and um, current's like the current thing to sum up. Um, but again, it, it gets a bit tricky because, uh, yeah, like the current isn't always a number in this case because you're looping through an object. The current is a type, it's like an object and I don't want to talk about this anymore because I actually just don't think you're going to come across a ton of cases in the course where you're going to find this deeply useful. So um, my point is you've seen it, play around with it, I'm not going to waste airtime on it, um, but keep thinking about it. We can combine a bunch of these things together. Um, I think I did this as we went with anonymous functions. I kind of showed you how we could simplify all of these. At least I did it for the filter stream. That was just to demonstrate that anonymous functions can make things really clean. Uh, and then we can sometimes combine tons of things together. Like, look at this. We've got a bunch of marks, 39, 43.2, 48.6, 24, 33.6. I can normalize the marks, which essentially means make them all out of 60. 
And in fact, let me let me um, let me copy. Let me look at this code with you. Um, what was it called? Map filter reduce. Okay, map filter reduce. Uh, let me show you. Like, let me copy out. Uh, I'll show you. Let's console log the line at each point, right? So, 4.1 map filter reduce. Okay. So, if I make this smaller again, and we just zoom out. We just zoom out and have a look. Let's see what we're doing. So, we start off with marks 39, blah, 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 blah. Normalized marks here are marks where we, we make them all out of 60. So, I think that's what's happening. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> They're currently out of 60. We normalize them to 100. So now all these marks, instead of 39, it's like 65 and stuff. So they're all out of 100 now. Then we want to filter them. We only want to get the passing marks. So we remove all the ones that are less than 40 here. Great. And now we reduce them by summing them up into 274. And then we divide it by the length of the, uh, the passing marks array to see what the, the average pass mark was. And again, you can see here how how powerful this can be if, if you get an array of um, functions, it's really easy for you to create a function, say, called like uh, average pass mark that takes in, say, you know, a marks, which is a numbers array. And then, oops, sorry. Um, I'm doing this all wacky. So there's like a function. And then I simply go and, you know, do this. And I just return average. So that would be an example of a cute little JavaScript function. Um, yeah, that's that's really it. Um, and you could play around with that if you want to, but that, that's kind of the gist of it. Now, that's that's it on map reduce filter. They're really really handy again, particularly map and reduce. But the last topic, which we'll talk about before the break, um, and just give about five or ten minutes to, is a really interesting topic called higher order functions. This makes them sound really fancy, but um, in a nutshell, higher order functions are functions that return functions. Uh, I like to describe them as mini function factories. They are function like robot. You know when you see like robots building robots. You know those Tesla factories, robots building cars. You know machines building machines. We're kind of just talking about functions that build functions. And this is a really, really, really amazing way to um, reduce repetition in your code. Where previous like. You know this experience as a programmer. Being a programmer is noticing repetition everywhere and only feeling like you can fix some of it or many of it, but not all of it. So this is like a great way that we can um, make our code better. So I've got a, a file here and it's got three functions in it. It's got a function that is called congrat, congrat. I don't know why it's congrat instead of congrats, but congratulate mark pass, congratulate mark credit, congratulate mark distinction. And each of those functions takes in a name that's a string, and each function says congratulations name on your pass or on your credit or on your distinction. Um, and then at the end, we console log one of these out. Now, if I said to you right now, if I was like, go and go and clean this up with the knowledge you have so far. Let me just get rid of a bunch of these files. If I said to you, you know, HOC1, go and clean this up. What might you do? You know, you might look at this and go, hmm. Like, this is what I would do. I would go, well, I guess we've got a generalized common pattern here, right? Which is to say, congrat string. And that takes in a name and it takes in a grade, which is another string. Yeah, okay. Like, and this, I hope, I hope your brain is thinking along this route too. And then you might say, well, let's have it return name on your grade like this okay cool and now what you can do which to make your life nicer is you can come down here and you can say actually i'm going to have these functions just simply return name and then the grade like this right bam um this is cool, right? This is what we would hope, I think, you you would do. That you would have the ability to look at that and say, I have now reduced repetition in my code. Because now I don't have to say congratulations three times, I can say it once. We're going to try and take this a step further here 
Um, I've just done that. Great. Okay, I'm one step ahead. Perfect. Um, but we're going to try and take it one step further by... What's the difference there? Oh, that's just new function syntax. That's okay. That's all the same. Um, <laughs> okay, I've just cleaned that up further. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah, sorry. I just had to remind myself. Um, so we can, let's take this on a journey. We can clean this up further by using new function syntax. Um, you know, const that equals that, you know, the usual thing. Uh, and then I can remove the return statements if I'd really want to. I probably wouldn't remove this one line return statement up here on line seven because it's just too small. Like the function's too big, but I can definitely do it for these ones, right? Make this even smaller and just say, you know, um, it, it starts to get a little heady. I'm aware of that. I know this is probably might start confusing you a little bit, um, but this works fine here. So instead of saying that, you know, congrat mark pass is just like, like what we had previously, in case I just moved too quickly, was we used to have this, like that. Um, but we've said, you know, because it's a one-line statement, we can go and simplify that back out. So now it's like, if you call congrat mark pass, it takes in a name and it simply returns you the value that comes from calling congrat string with that name and then pass. So this code's okay. This code's nice and okay. But there's another way to take that even further if we want to and use what you would call higher order functions, which is a little bit of a weird concept where what we would say, <coughs> let me just look at the code here. This is, this is quite hard to, uh, this, this, this stuff I actually think is the most confusing part of the lecture because I don't think it's very much like anything you've seen, but what we can say is that this function here, grat string, what we're actually going to have it uh, no, I'm just going to copy the code and we're just going to look at it side by side. There's no way to, I think, explain my way through this one. I, I can, I just think this will do you better. So here are two ways to solve this problem. They both lead to the same output, right? They both create three strings or three functions, right? Because congrat mark, congrat mark, credit and distinction. These are all functions and I call the function with the name Hayden. Down here, I've got three functions as well, and I call it with the, you know, the name Hayden. So the, the, the output here is the same, but let's notice what the difference between these two are. Well, one difference is that this giant function here is very big. And the other difference is that notice how I, and this is the key difference, notice how different this line of code is. Instead of saying for congrat mark pass, that it's a function that takes in a name and calls congrat string with name and pass, I'm actually saying that Congrat mark pass is just gen congrat mark with pass. So the repetition here is dropped even further. I don't have to repeat the function name, the function parameters. I don't have to repeat name. And the reason for that, and again, if you if this is the point where your brain start and turn off, that's okay. You can watch it later. It'll make sense over time. Don't stress. You're not stupid. I promise you. It's just like I have a function here called gen congrat mark. It takes in a mark string, such as pass, credit, or distinction. And what this is, this is a mini function factory, or a higher order function, where inside my function, I'm actually going to create a new function. And that new function is going to return congratulations name on your mark string, which is what I passed in. Again, I'm not, I'm not kidding you here. I, I would look at this stuff for hours, years ago, and I would just be like, what the is happening here um, because it is very heady and it's very it's very unlike C in particular which many of you have come from uh, but it's it's just it's very simple at its core this is a function that has created this function and returned it that's it a function creating and returning another function such that when I call g gen congrat mark with pass think about it like this when I call this function, what does it return? It returns this function for me. So let's just copy and paste that. So here, instead of gen, in fact, let me simplify these examples right down for you so that we have even less on the screen. There you go. There's some really simple examples. If I take this, I can just copy and paste this because my gen congrat mark function simply returns me another function. So I'm just going to go and paste this over this. And you know what? This name, this mark string here, was actually what I passed in when I called it, right? Because notice how when we called gen congrat mark, we passed in mark string, which was a string. 
So that's actually credit. So when my function was generated, this is actually now just the string credit. Cool. We ended up in the exact same place where we started, right? Because that was where we started, right? Back in HOC1. By, oh, that's, <laughs> I'm in that file now. Um, if we go all the way back to where we started on this, that's where we started. We started with a function that took in a name and outputted congratulations name on your credit. And when we look at where we finished, we ended up with the exact same thing. It's just that instead of having to type this all out manually, right? Um, we, we generated it, right? And this is so powerful because this means that we can go and do crazy things like just say, gen congrat mark for um, credit, you know, and then generate one for distinction and generate one for high distinction and generate one for pass or something like this, you know, and, and go rename all the, the functions. Um, so very, very, very concise, very concise approach to language. Uh, Jess says, it has taken me until now to realize that Mark isn't the name and is the Mark received. Oh my God, how am I supposed to understand JavaScript if I can't realize that? Uh, I don't know, because um, we're all silly creatures deep down. Um, I have this random story, which I'll tell the live people over the break for a few minutes. So let's let's cut to the, let's cut to the end of this and then, um, then I'll tell you a quick story about how stupid I am. Uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I've just I've done most of the demo of this. The lecture slides, to be honest with this, are more just so that you can follow it along in your own time. Like I, I mainly write lecture slides for people to glance at, not to talk to. So you can go and play around with this like evolution of the function. It's really crazy, powerful stuff. But again, this is quite heady, and this you don't see as much of. First class functions and things you'll see all the time, um, but. Not so much this stuff. A quick note too, at the end of the slides back here, I wrote, what the hell is a callback? Um, a callback is actually just another word for function passed into a function. If you ever see around the internet a callback, all a callback is referring to without getting too far into it is this. So you could argue that brackets is what they might call a callback because it's like a function passed into a function. So when you think about function in a function and callbacks are the same thing doesn't matter but if you see that word around that's what it means um and yeah that's it on higher order functions i do sincerely think wrapping up this lecture so please leave some feedback i do sincerely think that understanding first class functions understanding map and filter understanding anonymous functions i think they're all comfortably within the realm of what your average student in this course should be able to pick up on just like listening to the lecture I think the first, the higher order function stuff is a little bit headier and I think most people are just going to only really get that once you play around with it. It's something that really pays to play with. Um, so if you look at it and you think, oh, I'm stupid. No, you're not. It's just life is hard. You're very smart. If you're you're studying software engineering, you're all geniuses, right? Um, so just, just remember that. Um, yeah. So that, that wraps up that lecture. Thank you very much.